So I'm going to be talking about how we came to study genes for aging, or to ask whether there were genes for aging, those genes that affect aging. And we started this work in the early 1990s. And at that time, people didn't think that aging was subject to any kind of control by the genes. They thought, you just wear out, like an old car wears out. And um, there were several reasons that I thought maybe this would be wrong, this idea was simplistic. One is that if you just look around in biology, nothing just happens, it seems like. Everything seems to be regulated. Everything seems to be subject to control by the genes. And when you look at different species of animals, you see that they can have really different lifespans. And so the reason they have different lifespans, obviously, is because they have different genes. So that tells you right off the bat that genes have a lot to do with um, you know, the lifespan of an animal. So I had been working in um, the field of developmental biology. And during the time, during the 1980s and early 1990s, it had become really clear that basic fundamental mechanisms of life are conserved evolutionarily. So this, I lived through this realization in the field of developmental biology when genes that pattern the body of uh, worms, which is what we worked on, were the same as genes that pattern the body of fruit flies and mice which was amazing because these animals look so different, but there was a lot of commonality there. And um, the same thing was happening in other fields, like the cell cycle is driven by the same kinds of genes in different kinds of animals. So it seemed to me that something so fundamental as aging, you know, which seems to be evolvable. In other words, there are lots of, there are different animals that have very different lifespans, so evolution can definitely change the rate of aging. So anyway, it seemed to me that there might be genes that controlled aging, and so to find those genes, you know, if an animal has them, you could just, you know, treat an animal with something that causes mutations and look for long-lived mutants. So we didn't study this in, uh, in humans. Instead, we studied it in our little worm, C. elegans, which is uh, really nice for this kind of study because it's small and simple and it has a very rapid lifespan of just a few weeks. And actually, at the time we started our experiments, it was already known that there was a gene that affected the lifespan of C. elegans. And if you change this gene, the animals could live about 50% longer than normal. But there was a lot of mystery surrounding this gene. It, this, because these mutants, for one thing, were not very fertile. And so evolutionary biologists thought that it was possible that the reason that they live long was that they didn't have to channel all their resources into reproduction, so they would have more to live longer. But to me, it seemed like maybe uh, it wasn't such a simple trade-off. Maybe there really were genes that controlled aging. Um, and I should say one more thing, which is I was really fascinated by several things that had been known for a long time. One was progeria. There were human mutants that age much more quickly than normal. So that was really interesting to me. And the other thing was that there was um, a phenomenon called the Hayflick limit, where when you put cells in culture, they would just divide several times, or a few number of times, and then they would stop dividing. And it had been reported that if you took the cells from a young person or animal, they divided more times than if you took them from an old individual. And so there was some kind of intrinsic clock for aging. So it was such a fascinating field, and it was discarded by molecular biologists. They just thought there was nothing to study. And um, anyway, so we thought we would give it a try. So I then decided, OK, I'm going to look for genes that affect aging. And we already had a lab working on C. elegans. They were studying development. But my lab members had no interest in aging. They thought it was a real um, kind of a, what's the word, uh, a swamp? Is that the word? Anyway, not very interesting. And um, most people had that idea because it was nothing to study. And among molecular biologists, the field of aging had a kind of bad reputation. So I couldn't get anyone to work on the project. But the idea was to look for long-lived mutants. And so I kept trying and trying. And there are these students called rotation students who come into UCSF, where I work, UCSF, um, uh, and before they join a lab to get their PhD, they spend some time in each of three labs. So I tried to interest these students, and they didn't, weren't interested. But then one student named Ramon Tabtiang finally thought it was a great idea, and he decided to look for long-lived mutants. So amazingly enough, he set out to look for long-lived mutants, and he found, he found one. He found that mutations that reduce the activity of a gene called DAF2 double the worm's lifespan. And here you see in, in black, you see the lifespan of a normal worm. So by the end of 30 days, a month or so, all the worms are dead. But you see in red, the DAF2 mutant lives twice as long as normal, even more than twice as long. And the thing that was the most cool about this was that the worms were, they didn't just go into the nursing home and hang on. They were actually aging more slowly than normal. And I have a movie here to show you this. 
So what this shows you first is a normal worm, just to, to orient you. So this is a young C. elegans adult when it's about um, graduate student age. It's three days in worm time. Uh, and this is the long-lived mutant when it's young. And the reason I'm showing you this is so that you can see that the mutant looks healthy and active, looks great. And in fact, these mutants can be completely fertile. So there was no reproductive trade-off involved here. OK, so here is, a, um, here is a normal worm when it's old. You see its head is moving here. But otherwise, it looks like it's about to die, and it is about to die. And now the next you're going to see the long-lived mutant when it's the exact same age. And what you'll see is that the mutant, oh, these are some more, a dead worm here and a, another worm that's in the nursing home. So now what you're going to see is that at the same time, the long-lived mutant looks much younger than this. And I actually tell people about this. And they end up thinking, oh, it's like being 90 but looking really good when you're 90, like a 90-year-old who's healthy. But it isn't. And here's a little analogy. It's like this. Suppose you're single, and maybe in your 40s, and you're dating. And you find someone that you really like, and you go on a couple dates, and then you go with them to um, a restaurant. And you're sitting there with them, and then you ask, um, well, how old are you? And they say, I'm 80. You go, oh my god, because they look 40. And that's what it's like. It's like it takes two days to age as much as you normally age in one day. So it's something that, the reason I keep emphasizing this is that people don't realize, I mean, this is not something in our experience. We would never thought this kind of thing could happen. But it did. We just changed one gene, and we doubled the lifespan. So I told you that was really hard to find anyone to work on this project. Well, Ramon, the, gra the rotation student who dis made this discovery, didn't join our lab. He went to another lab. And I still couldn't get anyone to work on the project. But there were all these um, experiments that we wanted to do with DAF2 mutants. So we kept asking rotation students um, if they'd like to work on it. And they all did. They liked to work on it. So one after another, they would come to the lab, and they would do some more experiments on the DAF2 mutant. And finally, we wrote a paper. Um, for, and Nature published the paper. And except for me, every single person on the paper was a rotation student. And the amazing thing is not one of those rotation students joined the lab. They all went to other labs. And it was really a long time before anyone decided that aging was a sure enough bet for a PhD thesis that they would actually come to the lab and work on it. So what is this gene? What is this DAF2 gene? Well, the Gary Rufkin's lab cloned the gene. And they found that DAF2 encodes a hormone receptor. So that means hormones control aging. And not only that, it's similar to receptors that we knew about. Number one, this human receptor for insulin, which is a hormone that controls nutrient uptake. And also, it was similar to um, a hormone called IGF-1, which controls growth. And these hormones are similar to, to one another. That is, it was similar to the receptor for these hormones. OK, so, um, so what our findings had showed was that this, um, this, the worm's version of this same receptor had a third function. It also controlled aging. And we now know that what happens is that when you, when you slightly damage the DAF2 gene, it's, the animal sees it as a signal for danger. So it rolls out a protective stress response. And that's what makes it live longer. But anyway, the big question then, of course, was, is this just a worm thing? Or is this also the case for higher organisms? And I'll just say really quickly that inhibiting this gene can extend the lifespan of flies or mice. And there's a study of Ashkenazi Jews carried out by Nir Barzilai. And he showed that centenarians are more likely to have reduced function of the IGF-1 receptor gene than our uh, Ashkenazi Jews who die earlier. So at least in this population, this mutations in the same gene have been linked to uh, exceptional longevity. And we also found um, a gene called DAF16 is needed for the long lifespan. And humans have this gene, and it's called FOXO. And it turns out that FOXO variants are associated with exceptional longevity in populations all around the world. These little stars all represent a population showing that variants in this, in this longevity gene are present in people who live to be a long, to live a long time. OK, so I think the bottom line here is that you know, we started because we had an idea. I had an idea that aging would be regulated. We were really, really lucky to find the DAF2 gene. In fact, my colleagues had said to me, one of them said, you know, I knew people who started to work on aging, and they just fell off the edge of the earth as if the earth was flat. They just fell off the edge of the earth. But um, in this case, we didn't fall off the edge of the earth. We found something really, really interesting that may be conserved in humans. And actually, these mutants are resistant to lots of diseases. So there are all sorts of potential here for uh, improving human health. OK, but that's the story. Thank you.